We've been in Ohio experiencing all the aviation history and some flying adventures along the way. We've already done the $100 hamburger thing because food. Uh, we went and saw Neil Armstrong's hometown and museum that was built in his honor uh, in, in the comfort and luxury, of course, of a sweet PC-12. And now in this video, we're diving in headfirst into aviation history, visiting the Wright-Patterson U.S. Air Force Museum and the Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop in Dayton, Ohio. Come along. Cameron's dying. He's not used to snow. But Florida, man, this is no bueno. <laughs> okay, we are at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. Kind of doing an aviation history day today. Getting snowed on and testing out our flight outfitters yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your neck is like cinched I'm down into I'm your body. I'm away, man. It's a bit funny how every aviation history museum must start with the Wright brothers, and I suppose that's totally fair. But later in the day, stay tuned, we'd also go and see the Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop where they started everything. And after you're done with this video, perhaps you can go see when I visited North Carolina to First Flight Airport where they actually took the first flight. That's a really great video. But really, there's way too much to cover in a museum like this. We were there all day. It's mostly a, a history of war, obviously being the U.S. Air Force Museum, starting with World War I. Lots of history there, moving up through World War II, and obviously World War II was perhaps the largest aviation-based war there was, into the Korean War, Vietnam, Cold War, space race, modern aircraft that they're using today, and the list goes on and on. So there's a lot to cover here, and I'm just going to share a few of the more important stories that stood out to me that maybe I had a more personal connection to. So for those of you that don't know, just several months, about six months, five months after Pearl Harbor, we attacked Tokyo, Japan, or Japan in general, um, with carrier-borne B-25s. And that's what the Doolittle Raiders did. They took off from um, carriers and attacked mainland Japan as kind of a, a fighting back against Japan for what they did in Pearl Harbor, making a statement and did so at their peril. They had to launch early before they were really within range, which meant that um, a lot of them had the ditch on the other side as they were going to China. But it was a very successful mission. Definitely psychologically rattled the Japanese quite a bit. It's hard to put into words just how daring this Doolittle Raiders mission was not all the men made it back, and when they left, they knew they weren't going to make it back. Uh, not all of them, but they all decided to go regardless. And Dick Cole specifically, who I'll speak more about, he was 26 when this happened. And I don't know what you were doing at 26, but I was doing nothing close to that. These silver goblets were presented to the Doolittle Raiders by the city of Tucson, and in their reunions every year, they'd have these goblets and they'd toast to their reunion, but then they would turn the goblets over as their comrades passed away over the years and they're all turned over now and only Dick Coles is remaining because there's no one left to turn his over and he is the last two little raider to pass away. So I got to meet Dick at Air Venture several years ago and it's a really neat experience. I was really happy to be able to do that. I've always loved World War II and appreciated it, uh, what, what the men and women did during that war. And uh, it's always just special is like a, a certain good versus evil and of course the Doolittle Raiders did such an amazing mission um, so this is this is very humbling to see and uh, and emotional now for a little bit of context I mentioned that I got to meet uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole at Air Venture several years ago I happened to run across him and couldn't pass up the chance to say hello he was sharp for 100 years old um, when I told him that I was from Alaska he told me that one of the reasons they attacked the Aleutian Islands and actually took an island, the Japanese, was because they thought that the bombers had come from there. Having that personal connection to real history, having met, uh, having met Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole, who was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot, was just really special for me. And so this particular story really stands out. And, and I know that these men were real people and did amazing, amazing things for this country. 
in their service. Now we came across the Memphis Bell. Now I'm I'm sure you've probably seen the movie from the 90s. Uh, I sure have. I remember watching it as a kid. It was actually really well done and, and still a movie I think is worth watching. This aircraft is the actual Memphis Bell aircraft uh, restored. So this was the one that was on the missions. There's one out there that's been flying in air shows for a long time. I think it's still out there, but it's not the actual aircraft. This is the actual aircraft. So the claim to fame for the Memphis Bell is that they were one of the first, not the first, but one of the first B-17 crews to complete the needed 25 missions to then return home. At the time, this was incredibly difficult as the life expectancy of a crew was quite low. So they did achieve that. It, it wasn't easy. And then after the war, or, or during the war rather, they went out and uh, sold war bonds with Memphis Bell um, touring the United States. In 2005, uh, the restoration was started. They'd bring it back to near perfect condition, which you're now seeing here at the museum. In 2018, it was presented here at the U.S. Air Force Museum as a permanent piece and, and just really impressive. It, it looks brand new. And just to be in the presence of history like this, also with a bunch of the things that the, the crew had, things from their bunk lockers, I guess. It's just really, really cool. So certainly an amazing sight to behold and a true piece of history. So we were about to pass up this airplane, but then we realized it was the B-29 that dropped the last atomic bomb on Japan to end the war. It brings me no joy to celebrate an event like the dropping of the atomic bomb on Nagasaki. It's just really terrible. The fact that we even had to be there, everything is just not good. So if there's any positive to take away from this, it's that it meant the end of the war. Uh, which saved countless civilian and military lives. I just think of the crews of aircraft like this and what they must have been thinking, what they went through, and also their service. This is why I love coming to museums like this, especially with unique aircraft like this, unique pieces of history, because I don't want to forget. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to forget what happened, especially so we're bound not to repeat it. They say that's why history is important, right? So regardless of all that, this is still a, a, a very amazing piece of history and something that is sobering. So um, very cool to see. We're inside the bomb bay of a B-29. And this tube above me is the crew tube where they, this is a pressurized airplane. So that's how they get back and forth from up front to the back. In this area, it would actually be more of a crew area. So moving on through the museum, uh, we kept seeing more and more and more. It just never ends. You know, eventually you move through and you get to the more modern stuff, which is really cool. I like seeing a B-1 bomber and a B-2 and so on. Just countless airplanes. Pretty much any airplane that was in a theater of war or used by the military, you're gonna see here, especially obviously those that were used at one time by the Air Force. There's so much stuff here that it actually becomes a little bit overwhelming. I mean, it's just never ending. You could spend days and days here. Now we're in the more modern section, obviously, as you can see. Oh, that's just an SR-71 right there. Um, there's a B-2 wing just over the top. Stealth fighter back there, B-1 Lancer. Yeah, never ends. So speaking of Air Force, they have a really neat Air Force One exhibit. I suppose it makes sense that a collection of Air Force Ones would be at the Air Force Museum. I didn't really even think of that before we came, but we got to walk through most of them. And it was interesting seeing as the presidents got different airplanes, how the technology and the amenities improved over the years until eventually looking at the most historical one we saw. I think it would definitely be the, the 707 that brought Kennedy home after he was assassinated. And we all know that story 
that uh, that he was down in Texas and and was assassinated. And then he came back on the plane. So they had to cut out and remove part of the cabin in the back. And we got to see this uh, to be able to fit his casket in. And it was this actual plane that Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as president. So literally we got to stand where Lyndon B. Johnson became president. Moving on, we went through some of the ICBMs or intercontinental ballistic missiles, getting into more of the space race, you know, seeing the space shuttle, Apollo 15 command module and more, just starting to get into some more unique things that were maybe outside the normal war fighting capabilities of the Air Force. So I was really looking forward to the XB-70, which was supposed to become the B-70 bomber, basically. This prototype aircraft is, is just very interesting. I mean, you've never seen anything like this. It's meant to replace the B-52, flying at an altitude of about 70,000 feet and going over Mach 3. It was thought that it would be able to outrun any intercept aircraft from the Soviets and deliver a nuclear payload. It never did reach production, but I always thought it looked like an awesome airplane, and I was really looking forward to getting up close to it. And through their testing of the aircraft, they really did achieve those sorts of numbers. You know, the max altitude ended up being 74,000 feet. They did have sustained flight over Mach 3. So this thing, even though those records were set in the 60s, this thing was way ahead of its time. Just makes you wonder what they have that we don't know about now. All done at the museum. A little bit overwhelming. There's just so much in there. Wrapping up the museum, now it was time to rush over to the Wright Bicycle Shop before it closed. We're here at the Wright Brothers Bike Shop, and this is like a whole historical square that we're going to go check out and see what it's all about. From here, they began manufacturing their own line of bicycles, which meant becoming familiar with the technology of the time period. This building is also where the brothers were working when they first became actively interested in the whole idea of powered flight. And so really more than any other spot, this building truly is the birthplace of aviation. It's where the thought process began. One of the coolest things I've ever done as a pilot was flying to and visiting First Flight Airport and getting to see for myself where the Wright brothers took their first flight. The truth is it really actually didn't start in North Carolina. The plans, the design, the real work, actually the the creation of the airplane was even done in Ohio. So North Carolina was mostly a point of execution where the winds were favorable and they knew that they could do this well. But Ohio is where all the magic happened. I think that's a really interesting lesson for all of us to learn here. I mean, even today. It takes a lot of hard work before we fly to actually reach the goal of becoming a pilot. It takes persistence, it takes ingenuity, imagination, and a certain character to carry oneself through to the end, to that point where you become a licensed aviator. And that's a wrap. My time in Ohio has come to a close back where it all started for aviation. If you haven't seen the rest of the series already, go ahead and check out the playlist link for Ohio that just popped up above here on YouTube. I invite you to go over and watch more. We had a a really fun time. One of my followers from Ohio joked that there's not much to Ohio. And, you know, through my rose colored glasses, aviators, of course, It was quite a trip and I really enjoyed myself. I can't thank Mark from Flight Outfitters and John from Sporties enough for their hospitality. Just some really unique and fun flying experiences that we all got to have together. And of course, my friend Cameron for joining us. It wouldn't have been the same without him. Aviation is truly better when you share it with others. And the deeper you get into aviation, the more you realize that. And we all became better friends as a result of this trip. And, uh, and I'll look back on it with fondness. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for joining on this Ohio trip. Until next time, throttle on. <laughs>